I'm Ollie Welsh from Eurogamer and welcome to the developer sessions at EGX 2017. Uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, hi to everybody watching online. Uh, joining me on stage to talk about Xbox One X and the future of console technology. Uh, from Digital Foundry, we've got Rich Ledbetter and John Linneman. All right, thanks for joining us, guys. So we gave a session very similar to this one about six months ago at EGX Res in London. Um, and what I couldn't say at the very start of the session was that Rich had literally just the day before arrived back from Redmond where he had been given an exclusive preview of Xbox One X by Microsoft. Yeah, I remember you asking that question. I think uh, my initial response was, yeah, cheers for that, Ollie, because <laughs> I knew literally everything about Xbox One X, Project Scorpio at that point, and uh, wasn't allowed to say anything for another week. So, so we had to pretend it was all educated guesses. Yeah. Um, so how did that exclusive come about, and, and what was it like uh, visiting the, the mothership at Redmond? Well, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. When we do a specs reveal, usually it's from a leak. Mm. Uh, if you think back to PS4 Pro, uh, Neo, as it was called then. And the issue is, is that you just get a set of numbers and no story. And I think from our perspective, we got a great story out of that exclusive, but I think also from Microsoft's perspective, they got more than just the numbers going out there. And so it was kind of like a win-win for both of us, I think. And um, also, you know, we've been pretty passionate about 4K and uh, we kind of knew what the hardware was capable of and um, we were kind of best positioned to tell that story, I think. Did they have any surprises for you, or was it more, more or less as you had predicted at that point? Uh, the big surprise was how fast the clock is on it, how fast the actual processor runs, because we went in with a kind of series of preconceived ideas about console technology and what it could do. And in that particular respect, uh, the form factor as well, they just totally exceeded expectations there. So, yeah, that was fascinating, yeah. Um, so we should probably say, what, what are, what's everybody seeing in this video that we've got running in the background? Yeah, here? okay, so we had a press event about two weeks ago where we could actually capture a big bunch of Xbox One X materials. So in addition to our presentation here, we're showing you at this point, this is Rise of the Tomb Raider in its enriched 4K mode running on Xbox One X. Yeah, this is probably the way I would play the game, not the native 4K version. This basically gives you a much higher pixel count than 1080 and it layers on the bling. It gives you so many different visual effects that you won't get in the native 4K version. But there's uh, various other footage uh, running after this. This is a complete run through of the Gamescom demo. And then after that, we'll see how far we get. Is this pretty indicative of what, what you've seen of, of uh, uh, existing games upgraded to work on Xbox One X? Um, well, what do you reckon, John? Yeah, I feel like this has been a good representation of what we've seen thus far with the console. Well, of course, Rise of the Tomb Raider has more options than we typically see in these games, but still, you do get a native 4K mode, which is nice, and the enriched mode that we were just talking about here is actually using sort of the settings equivalent to the PS4 Pro's 1080p mode. So but you're getting sort of a checkerboard 4K presentation instead. Yeah, definitely. It's really interesting to see already a kind of differential opening up between the Pro and the, and the X. Early days yet, though, of course. And yeah. um, we'll have to see how that one works out. I just kind of get the feeling that we kind of living in a multi-platform world, so it makes sense for the techniques deployed on Pro to be ported to X as well, maybe with a resolution bump. We'll see about that. Yeah, I think that's about right. I expect we'll see a lot of PS4 Pro and like the using the checkerboard rendering 1800p, 2160p. Yeah. While Xbox One X targets native 4K, and there, there'll always be that kind of gap between them. Even if the Xbox One X is not targeting native 4K, right. I suspect we'll see a similar kind of gap. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, we've got so little source material at the moment to actually. Uh, be able to make any comparisons. This one is probably the first really interesting one because the developer Nixis really knows their stuff. So you've both played quite a lot of Xbox One X so far across uh, the showings at E3 and Gamescom and the recent event you talked about. Uh, what's your impression? Does it, is it, does it live up to your expectations? I think it definitely does the job in that it runs base uh, Xbox One games fairly effectively at four times the resolution. That's kind of what is needed. The thing is, the question is whether developers want to use the power to do that. So um, this is why on Tomb Raider, for example, they seem to be making a statement where the native 4K version, it's there and you can have it and it looks really nice. But this enriched mode, 
I kind of prefer it. And you know, yeah, give, I agree. given the choice between the two, I mean, this section here has real performance issues currently on the native 4K version, but it, it runs perfectly well on the Enriched. So, you know, th this is the kind of thing with the, the, this true 4K marketing. I think the machine can do it. The question is whether it's the best move for the user. Uh, Tomb Raider is great because you get the choice. I think another interesting one is I put up that video on Quantum Break this week, and a lot of people were sort of uh, disappointed by the fact that it wasn't running anywhere near a native 4K, simply because you, you have to look at what the base game is, because you're essentially taking a 720p game, one that's also very demanding on the PC as is, and bringing it to the Xbox One X. So you can't expect a native 4K or that kind of resolution out of everything. You have to take it case by case, I think. Yeah, four, four times resolution and hopefully some increased uh, visual quality features. That's, true. That's yeah. kind of what we suspect the, the, the kind of baseline is. And of course, I guess if, if people aren't going for pure resolution, then that's good news for people with uh, standard HD screens as well, because they'll be putting bells and whistles in that those people will be able to see. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I'm pretty sure this projector is actually 1080p, so you're getting downscaling on, on the feed anyway. And you just get exceptional anti-aliasing when that happens. So, I mean, this looks just awesome. It really does. And also, you can do downscaling on every game on the system, right? Which was kind of a big failing, I think, of the PS4 Pro. A lot yeah. of complaints have sort of bubbled up under that. Although, just uh, in the week, last week or two, Naughty Dog updated The Last of Us Remastered to add the downsampling feature back, which they removed for six or seven months. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> strange. So, it's clearly very powerful. It's clearly more powerful. How do you expect Sony to respond to uh, to the Xbox One X? Um, I don't think Sony are out of the game by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, the Pro is a cheaper machine, uh, fundamentally, and a lot of people have issues with uh, the Xbox One X's 499 price point. I think you kind of need to get used to more expensive consoles. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. So, you know, I think it's definitely got a role to play. I think, we were talking about this earlier, I think our sort of core disappointment, if you can call it, with, uh, with the Pro is that you never know what you're going to get. Whereas, um, so far, all the games we've seen have been targeting a presentation for on Xbox One X that looks great on a 4K screen. You can't say the same on the Pro at the moment, I don't think. Absolutely right, which is kind of consistent with what Microsoft has done in the past, even with 360, where the dashboard always sort of handles things for you. You, can, you get sort of a baseline experience in the developers. It's easier to target that, whereas the PlayStation is more kind of up in the air. There doesn't seem to be a lot of standards being followed there. Yeah, yeah. Pro is basically, uh, it is a supercharged PlayStation 4, but we were kind of sold to the 4K dream there. And, and you see a game like Horizon Zero Dawn, which is one of the oh, best yeah. 4K games you can play. That's great. And you kind of wish this was the standard on the Pro. We'll see about that. I mean, you can't bet against Sony, but obviously the differential between Pro and Xbox One X means that when PlayStation 5 comes along, it's going to be easier for them to trump their existing work. So, you know, that's, that's going to be interesting, I think. So, I mean, you mentioned PlayStation 5. Uh, all our indication from Sony is that um, they're not moving towards this sort of evolution model where they just inch forward the specs every couple of years. They, they still believe, despite the having brought out PS4 Pro, they say they still believe in big console generation steps. Mark Cerny said that, right? Yeah, when I, when I met Mark Cerny, that's exactly what he said. They believe in the console generation. Uh, whereas uh, Microsoft's approach, and actually before I had the hardware presentation, Mike Ubarra came over and said, right, this is our vision for the way Xbox is going to be. It's going to be similar to smartphones in that if you want the latest technology, you can get it. And on the one hand, there's a slowing down of pace in, in the way technology is evol evolving, which favors that model. But at the same time, if you look at the, the jump from PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4, we kind of need those generational resets to push developers on to a new baseline. And uh, that seems to be the approach that Sony will be doing for PlayStation 5. That was the impression that I got. And I think that will actually end up helping Microsoft too, because then obviously the, the, the baseline will be reset to that higher model and they will have their own uh, hardware as well, I would assume. So you definitely think there are, there are advantages to the old style console generations, as, as well as it being something which is just yeah, generally exciting yeah, for games. You can do, you know, there's been a whole bunch of stuff that's only been possible on this generation, like physically based rendering. I, well, they kind of well, tried to a degree, it, it was, they, they did it use it last year. gen. Yeah. It worked a little bit. Yeah, not so well. 
Yeah, and um, moving on to this gen, you know, basically the uh, the baseline was you know was moved higher, and you know everybody adjusted to that new baseline. That's really important, and that's kind of my concern with the iterative model that we won't get that baseline anymore, uh, which is a, a bit of a concern for me. But you know. I would suspect 2019, 2020, we will see PlayStation 5. The, the question is how much of an evolution it will be. I mean, if we look at the jump from PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4, the GPU six to eight times more powerful, probably eight times in the case of um, PS4. Memory is 16 times boost between the generations. I would be massively surprised to see anything better than a 2x boost. Mm. And then from there, we have issues of storage. Laptop drives in consoles, I think they're kind of here to stay. SSDs are just too expensive to put in a console. So, you know, you've got twice the amount of memory, but your storage mechanism isn't twice as fast. So, you know, that's a real problem for, as far as I can see. Uh, in terms of where we will see a leap, definitely CPU. Uh, the console CPUs are very, very weak as they stand right now. Big time. Yeah. We did some tests with Ryzen compared to uh, console. Um, that's the likely fit. And it was just massively, massively faster. So this is good news in a way, because even if we don't get the boost in memory, storage, we should see richer worlds, richer simulations, that kind of thing. Uh, it should be more complex games. So if you sort of flashback to Assassin's Creed Unity, it was just too ambitious for the consoles as they could handle technology at the time. Yeah, I think you're right. In fact, I'm not even sure that Assassin's Creed Origins has quite matched the lighting quality that we saw in Unity. You could tell that they were really trying to push out a very next-gen kind of experience. Yeah, so you look at AC Unity, that was a game designed with a generational leap in CPU in mind, as well as graphics, and they couldn't deliver uh, on the hardware side, and the, the software side really suffered uh, on that particular title. And if you look at, like, Battlefield, the 64-player games still don't run at 60 frames per second when practically everything else does. So, yeah, I do think uh, PlayStation 5, the next Xbox, CPU is going to be the most important generational leap there, I think. So we're in this situation where the, the rate of technology development is slowing down, you also got bottlenecks, as you've said, around stuff like memory and, and hard drives. Um, and, but we've still got these two different models from PlayStation, from Xbox, of, of how they're going to take that forward. What does all this mean for us, brass tacks, when it comes to price? Um, I think we will see what will be perceivably a generational leap uh, for, for PS5, maybe not as pronounced as uh, between three and four. I think you know games will be a lot more sophisticated. Uh, I think they will be targeting to get more out of a, a 4K screen. I think something like 80% of, of screens sold will be 4K by that point. So it makes sense to target that, that increased pixel density. I do think that the boxes will probably be if 399, if we're lucky, 499 more likely because the price of memory, uh, hard drives. The hard drive is the most expensive part of a console now. Those things are gaining in capacity, but they're not lowering in price. So there's a reason Xbox One X is $500. It's because they physically can't sell it that much cheaper without making a massive loss. One of the interesting things to consider with this generational upgrade and the different approaches is let's say Sony goes for a PlayStation 5 and they cut off the PS4 generation. Maybe there's backwards compatibility, but it won't. PS5 games won't run on a PlayStation 4. But if Microsoft says iterative, then essentially developers still need to support the original Xbox One. And how long will that last? And what will that impact with the games? That's kind of a interesting yeah, question. It is, and I think the developers will always have the answer there. So if you think back to the limitations on Xbox 360, uh, they weren't allowed to install to the hard drive. Uh, exclusively, but then GTA 5 came along and that game wouldn't be on Xbox 360 if they couldn't do that, so it happened. So I think there will come a point where the base Xbox One, they stop making games for it. And there may be a, a you know, it could be really challenging for uh, Xbox One X to launch, to, to run the next gen titles because the CPU will be that much slower than the, than the, following, the following machines. Is this slowing down applying to the PC market as well? And, and how are AMD and NVIDIA going to respond to that if it is? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question because um, the issue is basically that the amount of transistors you can squeeze onto a slice of silicon, I mean, you would get like a jump like pretty much every year, 18 months, uh, a few years back, but that's now changing. So 
uh, a particular fabrication technology will last for like two years, three years. So it's slowing down there as well. The difference is, I think, that PC gamers are more likely to invest more money in their systems. So uh, you do get stuff like you know, 1080 Ti, Titans. You do have SSDs, which I think are now pretty much a standard on a gaming PC. Yeah, for sure. But you know, it's, it's getting more expensive to embrace those technologies. But it is fascinating to see what's going on there. But you know, what, we were having a discussion about this earlier, and it was like, hold on a minute. You know, a graphics card, it has the memory, it has the GPU, obviously, it has the video outputs, it has the audio outputs, it has the video encoding, decoding. I mean, if it had, if it had a CPU on there, it would be virtually an entire system. You just need like a SATA port and some USBs, that would be it. So that's, that's fascinating, I think. Yeah, it's sort of realizing the Steam box potential, but in that case, it would be like, say, NVIDIA producing their entire system themselves. And we haven't really seen that yet. No, and I think AMD are actually uh, in a better position there because they have an x86 True. license that, um, that NVIDIA don't. But, you know, the point is that so much of a games machine is actually on the GPU now. I'm kind of curious whether they will branch out a bit and maybe try to produce a whole system. Now, you can say that it's nowhere near as upgradable as a PC, but at the same time, if you're upgrading your GPU every two or three years anyway, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point. Of course, we can't, we can't close this without mentioning Nintendo, who've thrown a bit of a curveball in uh, with the release of switch earlier this year which i think has surprised us all it might i'd say in a pleasant way uh, how do you guys feel that it's uh, changed the landscape switch is awesome <laughs> it really yeah, is i agree we uh, we went to the sort of initial reveal and it was like hold on a minute this is this is just a wii u in pausable form but since then titles have come out that have just blown us away uh, yeah for sure I think the GPU itself is, it may not be the strongest, but it's easy to work with. And I think it makes it quite possible to get essentially handheld versions of current generation console games, which is sort of realizing the vision that Sony wanted with like the Vita and the PSP, but more so. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a modern GPU. I mean, it's basically got the same feature set as the latest Nvidia graphics cards, uh, but obviously it's far less capable in clocks, frequency, so there is, a, there is a limit on what you can do with it, but, you know, we're seeing with the Doom port on that that there's some yeah, fascinating stuff incredible. being done with, with the Switch GPU. We'll be interested to see what, what, what happens with that. But the other thing, of course, is there's already a, a processor available that could produce a much more powerful Switch, the Tegra X2. So there could be a new Switch, like there was a new 3DS a couple of years down the road. Goes yeah, I think, I think Nintendo has a long history of producing enhanced versions of its hardware. And I think for the Switch, it kind of makes sense either they upgrade to something like Tegra X2 or they do the idea of like the super dock where, you know, if you have a 4K TV, you just dock it with this and it, you get an improved video output, slightly more powerful system. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, that, because on the one hand, Nintendo don't need state-of-the-art graphics. They just don't. No. But on the other hand, when you, you know, run one of their titles under emulation and you blow up like a Wii title to 1080p, it looks pretty awesome. Yeah, their art scales up beautifully to high resolutions, and I think it would really be beneficial here for the Switch. And because developers are already working to target two SKUs already, you know, adding in a third one, I mean, extra work, sure, but I think it's quite feasible. Yeah, so I really wouldn't be surprised to see like a super dock for the Switch. It might make things too complicated. I think at the moment the concept just really works as it stands. But it's an interesting possible direction they can go down. And it seems that, you know, they're basically the only console manufacturer that are still working with NVIDIA. And NVIDIA's R&D um, is, is just phenomenal. I mean, uh, the new Volta GPU range, $3 billion investment. And that is going to filter down, you know, throughout the stack, all the way down to Tegra. And they've obviously got GPUs that could be used in a super dock. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting partnership there. Okay, um, I think we've got some time to take some questions from the audience now. Uh, Bex is just going to put a microphone in the aisle there, so if you've got questions for Rich and John, just uh, form a line behind the mic, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Hey guys, uh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, my question's around kind of the modular effect. Obviously, you, you said about PC people upgrade their components all the time. Google's try to make a modular mobile? Do you not see Sony or Microsoft and even Nintendo trying that idea of a modular games console kind of upgrade the graphics card every three years? Um, 
Yeah, okay, so after the hard drive, the most expensive part of a console is the processor. So at that point, it kind of possibly makes sense simply to upgrade the console as in, in its entirety. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a possibility, but it possibly isn't likely to happen. I think they want to be able to have control of all areas of the system, so developers know exactly what they're developing for. So potentially you could have, you know, the latest and greatest processor paired with a last gen storage system and it wouldn't work out so well. I think fundamentally that sort of raises issues about add-ons, which we've seen before, whether it's like going back to the 32X or even stuff as recent as PSVR, which is pretty good, but the support just isn't there because the full PlayStation audience doesn't have it. So if you have like a GPU upgrade and only like 5% uh, of your users, 10% upgrade to it, What's the incentive to developers to actually take advantage of it? I think it's difficult to market as well. For sure. Hi, um, you said about the Xbox One X running in full WAC 4K, uh, but you also noticed about the scale back version, but with some of the improved lighting and performance. For yourselves, for your bang for your buck, do you think if you don't have a 4K telly to run it in that mode is worth the 450 investment? It's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, you do get yeah. super sampling, which um, you should be able to see it here. It looks pretty awesome. Um, I think in this case, it's actually worth more than with the PS4 situation because a lot of Xbox One games are not 1080p already, right? So at the very least, you're getting, even if you're just outputting 1080p or down sampling, you're gonna have image quality that looks a lot better than a standard Xbox One. So in that sense, I do feel like it would actually be a more substantial upgrade for an Xbox user to go to the X than it was for a PS4 user to go to the Pro if they have a 1080p TV. And um, in the games you've seen and things, are there any other advantages like lighting or particle effects that are changed from Xbox One to One X or is it only resolution really? You looked at Quantum yeah. Break. Well, there's two. With Quantum Break, for one, I did notice that some of the details, it seemed like it was using the greater draw distance effects and yeah. you, know, you could see more detailed trees and buildings at a distance, with, more like the PC. And then with Tomb Raider, obviously, you have that enriched mode, which was not available on Xbox One, which, you know, the native 4K mode on Xbox One X is, seems to be equivalent to the standard Xbox One, but the enriched mode offers many more details that's comparable to the PC version. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, I'm a, a bit of an older gamer, and uh, I like the Digital Foundry videos, by the way. I've just got into them. Um, do you think we're getting a bit um, bogged down and lost in this 4K resolution, 60 frames per second, like, and losing out on actual games and gameplay, and you know, making games narratives interested and story, or do you think there's room for both, really? Do we sometimes get a bit sort of like you know, desperate to look at screenshots and look at look at comparisons between Xbox and PS4 and PC? I'm not sure necessarily, because <laughs> one thing about older games, if you go back to the 16-bit generation all that, 60 frames per second was the standard. Yeah. That's what games ran at, and that's how they played best. And we've yeah. lost that. And yeah. I feel like a lot of people are trying to get that feeling back that you used to have playing those older games, and it's difficult. So I think rewarding, sort of focusing attention on the games that really push boundaries in that regard is kind of important. And it's been great to have the Switch as well. Because, I love the Switch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, fundamentally, the concepts have really got to shine there because it can't fall back so heavily on the technology. And yeah. when you look at what Zelda is doing, you know, it, it, it launched pretty much at the same time as Horizon Zero Dawn. They're both awesome games, but people talk more about Zelda. You know, that, that, that was the game that caught people's imagination. So, yeah, there is, there is much to what you say. It, for me, yeah. myself, actually, the one thing is that when... When the tech in a game is not optimal or there's problems, it actually impacts my ability to enjoy the narrative and the gameplay. It's distracting. Yeah, so sure. knowing that a game performs a certain way is kind of, it's an important tool as well. You know, for some of us, like, I just find it interesting. I think other people do as well. But even just for the consumer that's not really into the tech, they might want to know, like, hey, does this actually work okay? Or is there problems with it? So I think the information is valuable for a lot of people and, you know, yeah. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. Love the videos. Hi. Um, I think my question kind of follows on from that, really, pretty much, in as much as what do you think is more important, resolution or frame rate? Um, because, and based on your answer, do you think that developers should focus more on 60 frames rather than 4K? Because to me, 
being a PC gamer and a console mm -hmm. gamer, it's more noticeable the difference between 30 and 60 than say 1440 and 4K. Yeah, I, I'd I, much I, rather play a game yeah, at 60. Yeah, I agree. I definitely play the game at 60. The issue is that uh, in t certainly in terms of the uh, the parts available to the console makers, basically you need you need Zen. You need the Zen CPU cores to do that. They weren't available for either the Pro or the X. So it's almost like this is the best that they could do. And obviously yeah. at the same time, the 4K screens are going to be a really big deal. So they could they can scale up to that. But, you know, 60 frames a second, if the developer wants to target it, then that is going to be an option with, with the next gen, I think, because the CPU power will be there. Sorry, just, just very quickly as well, do you think that if the Microsoft really want to sort of like, you know, push this, you know, next gen console, whatever, they should sort of say, make games at 60 frames and say, right, this is the... Xbox can do 60, PlayStation can only do 30. Because to me, as a, if you like, general person in the street, they would see that difference as opposed to the I, resolution. I agree, and I actually think that that's kind of what Nintendo has done with their own software, but you can't mandate that, I think, on a platform. That's going to have to be something that's always up to the developers. Yeah, they can't mandate it to developers, but at the same time, look at all of the top-selling games every year. FIFA, uh, Call Duty. of Duty, Battlefield... Everything except Grand Theft Auto, which <laughs> Everything except for Grand Theft Auto is 60 hertz, you're right. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. Do you think the shape of the Xbox One will be different from the Xbox One X? The shape? Yeah. Um, it's, it is a different machine, yeah. It's, yeah, much, yeah. It's, it's significantly smaller than the S, yeah. So... Um, yeah, that's actually a really interesting part of the design. It's it's much much smaller. Well, it's not much much smaller than the no, than the S. It's similar to the S, yeah. but a little bit smaller in some ways. Uh huh. Yeah, and it's actually the, that is a massive technological achievement to get that much power into a smaller box. It's the smallest Xbox they've ever made, and that was kind of one of the key things that they actually wanted to show me in person when I went to to see the hardware. Thank you. Hey. Uh, uh, Given that Microsoft has been uh, not having any exclusive for their consoles, they've been releasing all their games on uh, Windows as well as Xbox and promoting Xbox as a platform rather than as a piece of hardware. Do you envision Sony following suit and also partnering with, say, Canonical to pr bring out games for Linux or promote their platform in a different way rather than tying it to the hardware? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think they want to be in charge of the whole ecosystem there. Uh, obviously, Microsoft has a vested interest in doing PC ports uh, because they, they run the environment there. They're trying, obviously, to challenge Steam, I think, with the Windows Store. Uh, they need to do a lot of work there because it's... Yeah, we tried downloading the Forza demo the other day. We had problems doing that. We still have problems downloading games on the Windows Store. It's, they've got a long way to go there. But, you know, they kind of want to expand out um, Xbox as a platform beyond the hardware. I think you're right about that. I don't think Sony will follow suit. They have, they have the Gaikai streaming to, to actually achieve that. But, yeah, I think it's, it's basically a very different approach there, different vision. Okay, thank you. All right, well, looks like that's all the questions, which is convenient because that's all the time that we've got. So uh, thank you very much for coming, and thank you to Rich and John from Digital Foundry. Thanks for coming, really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you.